Okay, so um, hello and welcome. My name is John Beekman. I'm a librarian here at the New, uh, New Jersey Room at the Jersey City Free Public Library. Our program's gonna start in a moment, uh, but I wanna take a little time to point out some information that's uh, found on our library's website, jclibrary.org. Um, as we prepare for a phased reopening of our library's buildings, we're going to post details on a dedicated page, which you'll find in a link at the top of the website. Uh, we are anxious to resume our services to the community as soon as it can be done safely and in compliance with state and local guidelines. Until that time, uh, please check out our expanded array of digital resources. We've been actively adding databases and services as well as growing our collection of ebooks and other materials available for digital loan. Um, and also, please check out the weekly schedule of our virtual programs offered on Facebook Live, uh, as well as here on YouTube, um, including a uh, continuation of our Juneteenth commemorations with a children's event tomorrow morning at 10 on Facebook Live and the Community Awareness Series uh, annual Juneteenth celebration, which will be here on YouTube at 3 p.m. or 2 p.m. Sorry, I'll get that date <laughs> time to you by the end of this meeting. Uh, okay. With that, we're gonna to start today's program. So we are meeting here on June 19th the Juneteenth holiday, which has just this year been recognized as an official holiday here in Jersey City. Juneteenth commemorates the day in 1865 when news of the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation finally reached the enslaved peoples of Texas at Galveston. And also in 1865, the 13th Amendment was drafted and ratified, abolishing the practice of slavery in the United States. Uh, it wasn't until the 14th Amendment passed in 1868 that formerly enslaved peoples were granted additional but not full rights of citizenship. And with the 15th Amendment's passage in 1870, granting the right to vote to all men and only men, regardless of race, that the so-called Reconstruction Amendments began to make good on the promises of liberty espoused in our nation's founding. Continuing to make good on these laws, uh, has been a process that continues to today. And it's this, just the symbolism of the people of Texas finding out only that they've been free by law years earlier is a powerful part of this Juneteenth commemoration. And uh, while our story today concerns a free African-American man voting in New Jersey, a closer look at his story connects him to that long story of dreams deferred. So here to talk about that man, Thomas Mundy Peterson of Perth Amboy, New Jersey, is Gordon Bond. Uh, Gordon is an independent historian, author, and lecturer. Uh, he is the founder and e-publisher of GardenStateLegacy.com, a free online quarterly magazine dedicated to New Jersey history. The author of six books focusing on aspects of New Jersey history and has written a large number of articles and reviews for Garden State Legacy, again, gardenstatelegacy.com. Gordon has several talks on New Jersey history topics and is known for his creative and entertaining PowerPoint presentations, which I guess we're gonna see one today. Uh, his other areas of research include the Reverend Hannibal Goodwin and his invention of roll photographic film, the 1926 Carteret race riot, and he and his wife, architectural historian and conservator Stephanie Hoagland, are studying New Jersey's folk grave marker tradition. When he's not researching and writing, Gordon runs his own freelance graphic design business, Gordon Bond Designs. He has designed exhibits for the Middlesex County Office of Arts and History, which includes some material from the New Jersey Room at the Jersey City Public Library, and the Abraham Stats House in South Bound Brook, and the Historical Association of Woodbridge Township. Um, Gordon is a native of New Jersey, living with his wife and cats in Newark's historic Forest Hill neighborhood. 
So really appreciate you being with us here on this uh, on this on this poignant day of commemoration. Uh, now more than ever, it seems like we're always saying now more than ever on this topic, but now more than ever. Yeah. Um, and so just before we get into your your talk and and your your famous slideshow. Uh, if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about what makes your book different from what's generally known about Thomas Mundy Peterson. Uh, and because, you know, the preface of your book has some really nice insight into how your research changed your view of the subject. And, and maybe you could just talk to, uh, tell us a little bit about that before we start. Sure, sure. Thank you. And first of all, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to, to speak for the library. This is certainly an appropriate day to be doing this, to be talking about this subject. Um, yeah, so I think if most people have heard of Thomas Bundy Pearson before, it's because of his vote. It's because he's the first African-American to vote under the 15th Amendment. And we're gonna talk about that in my, in my slide presentation a little more. Um, but I, I, I always say that he, um, his story even today gets presented as a step in an evolution towards a more perfect union. And it's a very uplifting story. It's a very happy story. It's a story of progress. It's a story of egalitarianism and so forth. And it is that. But what I found is that when you take a step back and you look at his story beyond just the vote uh, or beyond the voting medal, which is what we're going to talk about today, that's the other thing that people oftentimes know about him, what you discover is a much more complicated uh, story. Um, this is somebody who a man whose life spanned the, re the Reconstruction era through the early 20th century and saw both the promises and the reversals that took place. The, the promise of, the, of, the, of Reconstruction that was left unfulfilled by the dawn of the 20th century and then, of course, into today. So uh, it's not quite such an uplifting, happy story. And yet at the same time, when you look at something like the voting medal, in that context, what happened in Perth Amboy, what happened in New Jersey, what happened to, to Thomas Pearson becomes all the more unique and interesting and I think very uh, reflective of what a lot of other African Americans were going through at that time, what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more evocative of the common person's experience. Uh, so his story is, it tends to be filtered through a white lens. The, the, it's talking about how progressive the people in Perth Amboy were. They encouraged him to vote. They celebrated his vote. Uh, and that, very, that is true, and that is worth celebrating, that is worth noting, especially because it was unique for the time. But what I found happened is he becomes a prop in their story. He, he, Thomas Peterson, as an individual, becomes uh, secondary to the vote. So the, the very thing that lifted him, him out of obscurity ends up obscuring him. And so once I took that step back and I saw the story in context, in historic context, uh, looking at what he did after he voted, suddenly I realized this story is a lot different than what I think most people know. It's a lot more fascinating, a little more complicated, Not it's a little messier, uh, but it's also much more relevant. And I think that's what makes it just so compelling. I think it's any time uh, somebody becomes a symbol, you know, that they, they, they lose their humanity in that. There's a threat of that. And um, with, with somebody whose agency is already threatened, like an African-American man like Thomas Peterson, uh, it's, all, it's all the more tragic when that, when that process happens. And so I think you've done some great work in uncovering the man behind the symbol and uh, I look forward to, to hearing more about what you have to say about the subject. So um, I guess we can uh, start your talk proper now, if you'd like. All right, I'm gonna do the share screen here. All right. Okay, that looks good. All right. So as I said, if you have heard of Thomas Bundy Pearson before, it is probably because of what happened in the next slide that for some reason I can't get to advance. There we go, all right. Um, on March the 31st, 1870, Thomas Peterson, who we also know as Thomas Mundy Peterson, 
He became the first African American to vote under the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Now, what had happened was the uh, 15th Amendment, this is the third of the three Reconstruction Amendments that John mentioned, uh, it was certified by the Secretary of State as the law of the land on March 30th, 1870. And it just so happened that the following day, March 31st, Perth Amboy was holding a uh, city charter referendum election. And what had happened was they had decided they wanted to revise their city charter. They wanted to change it. It had been approved by the state legislature, and now it was to go to a vote of Perth Amboy citizens to decide whether or not they were going to accept it. And this is the election, a special election. This is the election that Thomas Peterson got to vote in. And here he is casting his vote. Uh, so uh, his side, the side that he voted in favor of this new charter and his side did win the election. And um, so it was known at the time that he probably was the first black man, or as they would say, colored man to vote in the United States. Uh, under the 15th Amendment. And for uh, the next roughly 14 years, he sat in, you know, secure in that knowledge that he occupied this uh, historic spot. Um, and it seemed to be pretty safe until somebody noticed a little filler article. I refer to my notes here. Uh, this was in the Princeton Press for April the 5th, 1884. Now, this is a, a newspaper article that is talking about a man named Moses Schenck. Uh, he is a, uh, oops, sorry, jumped ahead there a little bit. Um, and uh, so they're making a comment that he, that he this man, he is a musician. Uh, he's known far and wide as the professor. He's having a splendid run of business. He goes even as far as Atlantic City this season. He has officiated 125 sociables. Okay, you know, so far so good, interesting. Uh, but then they add this bit as an aside. By the way, he wears a medal conferred upon him by the people of New Jersey in honor of his being the first colored citizen to vote under the 15th Amendment in this state. Who they were referring to is Moses Schenck, Moses Shank lived from 1833 to 1890. He was a well-known uh, fiddler, banjo player in the area, and he led a band that was known as the Princeton Colored Orchestra. And there was a, a commentary, uh, this is in a uh, Rawway's, uh, Rawway, New Jersey's National Democrat. Uh, this popular band is constantly receiving calls from different parts of the state. Many passengers on the train have also enjoyed the sweet music rendered by this famed company of musicians as they go or return from their engagements. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, census records from this time, you discover he also worked as a waiter in various hotels. He was uh, uh, a meat carver uh, for the restaurants and so forth. And um, evidently he was supposed to have been this voter in Princeton and this bit about him being the first voter was really the first challenge to Pearson's priority. So what Thomas Peterson did, he asked the, uh, his white friends, the, some of the main movers and shakers in Perth Amboy at this time, to investigate Schenck's claim, and to find out if he really was the first color voter or not. Uh, the leader of this uh, committee was J. L. Carney, J. Lawrence Carney. Uh, this is the son of Commodore, Car Commodore Carney. Some of you who are familiar with Perth Amboy may know of Carney Cottage. This is where he lived. Um, now, Carney occupies an important spot in uh, Peterson's story because Thomas Peterson was working in the stables behind uh, Carney's house on the day of the election. And it was Carney who went out to the stables with the newspaper showing him that the 15th Amendment was now the law of the land. He told them that, uh, he told them that there was a, this election and they encouraged him to go vote. Now, uh, this was an interesting time in Perth Amboy's history. A lot of people don't realize there was a uh, community, a very progressive experimental community called the Raritan Bay Union. It had been uh, founded by Rebecca and Marcus Spring. Um, and later on, it would become the Eagleswood Academy during the uh, Civil War period. And this was a, a mix between a, uh, a utopian community, a boarding school, an artist colony, 
the, 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 the main um, intellectual theme was reformism, progressivism, abolitionism, women's rights, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so this was a very fertile ground for someone like Peterson. This is, to them, this was an honor to have the first black voter under the 15th Amendment, the first black voter in the entire country under the 15th Amendment. So uh, Carney, uh, he had encouraged Peterson to go vote. Peterson met two other people on, on his way who also encouraged him to vote. So it was a very interesting and unique time uh, in, in Perth Amboy and in New Jersey's history. So Carney was the one who was the head of this committee and the rest of the people were drawn ecumenically between Republicans and Democrats. I'm just gonna go quickly through some of the people here. Um, show you the kind of people that he was friends with. John L., these are the Republicans. Uh, John L. Boggs, 71-year-old accountant and former collector of the courts. Uriah B. Watson, he was a 44-year-old firebrick manufacturer, a banker, he was an ex-mayor. Uh, Isaac T. Golding, he was a 47-year-old accountant, he was a city treasurer at the time. Patrick Convery, a 42-year-old coal merchant, he was a rising political star at the time. He was the one who was manning the polls on the day that Peterson voted. Now, William Patterson, 67-year-old lawyer, land developer, and we're gonna actually come back to him later. He plays an important part in, in Peterson's story. Uh, he was also an ex-mayor, and at the time he was a judge. And then John Fodergill, he was a 46-year-old alderman and streets commissioner. So you can see they're drawing from very prominent uh, members of the Perth Amboy uh, community. Uh, so they wrote to the editor of the Princeton uh, newspaper to get details about, about the story, about Moses Shank. And when the reply uh, came back, um, Moses, I'm sorry, I need to move something here that is in my way. Are we having some technical difficulties, Gordon? I think we've lost yeah, your. Uh, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, I just needed to move something uh, that was in my way. I, I wasn't able to read. Uh, okay. To read my. So bear with me here. I apologize. I can't get. There my, we go. All right. It looks like we're looks like we're back uh, with the slides. So. Yeah, I just uh, want to move these out of my way and now we should be good okay i apologize for that uh all right thanks this, this is very interesting so far so thanks this is this is, this is the, the joys of modern technology all right here we go maybe there we go okay so the response came back from the editor of the newspaper uh moses shank was born in princeton and quite an intelligent man on the 4th of april 1870 monday at the annual election for borough officers Moses Shank was the first of about 100 colored voters to cast a ballot. I gave Moses the medal and by it did not mean to claim for him more than he was the first voter in Princeton under the 15th Amendment. I have just spoken to Moses about it and he says he does not set a very high value on Peterson's claim for he only voted on a question of a charter amendment while here it was the regular election for mayor, council, etc. Uh, so it was traditional around this time that the uh, elections, the general elections for those offices would be held in April. Uh, it was kind of a matter of luck that Perth Amboy was having this special city charter election on the 31st. If, uh, they, if they had waited until uh, their regular election for Pearson to vote, then uh, he would have shared the honor with a lot of other people. So uh, that was kind of a stroke of luck. Uh, but that complication or that, that consideration aside, what is the side point here is that he voted on April the 4th, 1870. So April the 4th, uh, that means that Pearson's priority is still preserved. Now, the other thing that they noted in, in the Princeton article was how uh, Moses Schenck had a silver medal that he wore uh, in honor of his being the first colored voter in Princeton. And certainly if that was the case, uh, Perth Amboy, as a matter of civic pride, since they had the first black voter in the entire country, certainly he should have a medal and it should be a gold medal. So they did a whip around and they raised $70, which uh, in uh, 2020 dollars is worth around $1,850. 
and decided that they were going to have a gold medal made for Thomas Peterson. So they went to Alfred J. Henning and J. E. Iman. This, these were uh, engravers. This was a company in Manhattan. Now, a little bit of history on them. They, uh, they made a name for themselves making these things, uh, daguerreotype frames. So daguerreotypes was a form of photography uh, that, uh, in the early uh, 19th century where there was uh, a piece of metal, polished metal, the, uh, it was coated with a photographic emulsion the, or a photographic uh, photosensitive coating. Uh, the picture was made on that piece of metal. They developed it and they gave it to you. And that was it. That was the only picture you had. These were one-offs. So they were very precious. Uh, they were also could be fragile. They could be scuffed. They could be scratched. So they needed to be protected. And what this company did was uh, they had a going business making uh, these types of frames that you could protect your daguerreotypes with. And this is an example of one of their, of their frames. You can see how ornate uh, it is and, and the, the skill level that went into creating it. Now, by the time uh, the Perth Amboy contingent came there to um, have this metal made, these had, had gone out of fashion and uh, new forms of photography had come along that didn't require them. So they started making uh, metals. Now, in the 19th century, it was very common and very popular for uh, these, these metals to be minted uh, for schools would give them out for spelling bees or athletic uh, competitions, fraternal organizations would have them made, uh, stores would have them made. They would be almost like a form of coupon that uh, you, you would receive, the, you, you buy something, you receive one of these coins and eventually you can redeem them for a product later on. Um, but they also made them for political convention. And this is one of their, their uh, medals uh, for Abraham Lincoln. This was made for his 1860 presidential run. This was the, this was the election where he won the presidency. They also made for other uh, political figures. This is Stephen Douglas. So um, when the Perth Amboy uh, committee arrived to have this medal made, they saw this, uh, the, the Lincoln uh, medal in particular, and thought this would be very appropriate, for a very uh, appropriate subject for, uh, to honor the first black voter in the United States under the 15th Amendment. And I'd always wondered why Lincoln did not have a beard on this, uh, since by this point, of course, the bearded Lincoln, President Lincoln, was a part of the iconography. Uh, now I know why, because it was actually patterned after the 1860 Lincoln. Now the back, of course, okay, so th this is the metal. The, uh, this, is, this is struck from gold. You can see it's the same profile. The back, of course, would have to be um, would have to be customized and it says presented by citizens of Perth Amboy, New Jersey to Thomas Peterson, the first colored voter in the US under the provisions of the 15th amendment at an election held in that city, March 31st, 1870. Now what's interesting is that there are uh, different version, not different versions, but different strikings of this metal that were made of other materials, other metals. And, um, Still, you can find the, the numismatic catalogs and uh, auctions and, and different collections. And the materials uh, included silver, copper, aluminum, and something called white metal, which was a, a tin alloy. And what I think was happening here is they made multiple strikes of this metal in these other, this kind of hierarchy of metals, MET metals. Um, the, you know, maybe this, the silver copy went to the mayor or the copper one would go to somebody else all the way down to the, the white metal one. That would probably just be a souvenir that would be handed out to the general public since that was the cheapest version. The gold one, of course, is the presentation piece. That is the one that would go to Thomas Peterson. Now this one also, uh, the presentation piece also had this extra piece uh, this bar that says Thomas Pierce and Perth Amboy. It's a lesser quality gold. I'm not sure if uh, Henning and Iman made that as well or if a local jeweler had made it. Uh, but this had the clasp or the, the pin on the back of it that would allow it to be pinned to Peterson's coat. So the date that they chose to award this medal was May the 30th, 1884. Uh, this is Decoration Day. This is a uh, sort of a precursor to Memorial Day. Um, 
the idea of decorating veterans' graves was it's something that you find in a lot of cultures. It's usually in spring when there are flowers in bloom that can be used in the decoration process. And of course, this holiday took on a special importance in the United States after the Civil War. Uh, so there were a lot of other events that were happening that day throughout the city, throughout uh, the country. Uh, and they decided that this would be a good opportunity to also have this event giving Peterson his medal. The ceremony was to be held in this building. This is Perth Amboy's City Hall. It's one of the oldest extant city halls in the country. Um, it is appropriate uh, that this, this event would be held here on a couple of counts, not the least of which is during the colonial era, there were slave auctions that were held in front of this building in the town square. Uh, for Thamboy as a port city, uh, they used to bring slaves direct from Africa, and they had barracks that they would keep them in uh, down by the waterfront, and then they would march them into this uh, into the square in front of the, the, the city hall to have them auctioned off. And now this is the site of celebrating the first uh, African American voter under the Fifteenth Amendment. This is also the building that Peters, in which Peterson cast his vote in the council chambers. That was where the ballot. Uh, box was set up. I should also point out that uh, in the audience that day was a woman by the name of Lucy, um, let's see, do I have her age here? Lucy was 84 years old. Lucy was Thomas Peterson's mother. Now, Lucy uh, had been a slave as a young woman, so she knew what slavery was all about. She had experienced it personally in her own life. And uh, here she was, she had lived long enough to witness white men pinning a medal to her son's coat for being that first voter under the 15th Amendment. So uh, I mentioned William Patterson before and that we, we would return to him. William Patterson was the keynote speaker at this event. And his role in Peterson's story is, is kind of interesting and important. Um, so, Long story short, Thomas Peterson married a woman named Daphne Reeves. Daphne Reeves' mother, uh, Betty, had been owned by a man in Perth Amboy named Andrew Bell. When Andrew Bell died, he left in his will uh, a $500 legacy to Daphne and also to her sister Jane, which was very generous, especially at that time, for a white man to be leaving this money to the daughters of a former slave. Um, there's speculation as to why exactly he did that, and I go into that in the book. But um, the money was put in trust. Uh, William Patterson controlled it. He was the one who uh, invested it and put it into the bank, deposited into a bank for her, and uh, they would draw off the interest, and that was what they were able to live on, as well as what Peterson himself earned from doing odd jobs. He was a, a janitor, and um, he had worked as, uh, on boats, uh, on the Arthur Kill and so forth, but he was basically an odd jobs man. Uh, but these, those were their revenue streams when they were they were building their family in Perth Amboy. Um, when they decided they wanted a house of their own, what they did was to give turn over that five hundred dollars to William Patterson. William Patterson had a house built for them on what was then Commerce Lane, just south of uh, Commerce Street, which is still in Perth Amboy. Uh, and you can see where the house was uh, in, the, in this uh, Sambor map drawing. Uh, the house is no longer in existence, but it is an empty lot. There hasn't been a whole lot built on top of it. And I'm hoping that at some point we can do an archeological investigation of that site, since anything you find there would necessarily date to the Peterson's uh, occupation of it. Um, so in any event, uh, Pat it's Patterson, obviously he knew Peterson, he knew the family. He was sympathetic to the idea of a black man voting. He was there to celebrate him. And yet uh, the language that he employs is kind of interesting and I think very uh, reflective of the attitudes at that time, even among people who were in favor of things like Negro suffrage and abolition and so on. Now, his speech itself to the modern ear sounds very verbose, very florid, very almost painfully long to read. But I'm sure at the time with the romanticist sensibilities, uh, the taste of the time, I'm sure that it went over very well. But I wanna focus on um, two phrases that he employs that I think are evocative of what we're talking about here. So 
he wants to talk about why it's been uh, 14 years between when Peterson voted and how, when they finally get around to giving him this medal. So he needs to talk about Moses Shank. He needs to introduce the idea that there was a black man in, Peters in, in Princeton who had also claimed to be that first voter. Um, and the phrase that he uses is, there is a common saying familiar to all that a darkie is under the wood pot. Now, this is a common colloquialism. You see this uh, in other contexts in this same time period, including with a word more offensive than darky. Um, and it is used, it, it, it's, it's an allusion to the stereotype of the sneaky, dishonest Negro. And Patterson could have just said there was a black man in Princeton who claimed to be the first voter. Instead, he employs this phrase. And what this phrase is implying is that there was something maybe nefarious or sneaky or dishonest in Moses Shank's claim. Uh, that it couldn't have just been a misunderstanding, that, that there was something more to it. And it plays into that stereotype of the quote, dishonest Negro. And again, you know, this is something that where he could have employed a much, you know, simpler language, but he decides he's going to use this rather um, odd phrase, phrasing odd uh, rhyme. Uh, so he says, so it came out not long ago that another of the colored clan to make a rhyme say black and tan, living in a university town of high repute where the same dark hue was interwoven in the academic flag. Um, why he felt to, necessary to insert that, that little bit of poetry, I don't really know. I'm sure, again, he probably thought he was being very clever in doing that. Uh, but also just the use of uh, talking about the, the, the dark hue interwoven in the academic flag. This is Princeton. It's Princeton University. What are the, the colors of Princeton? Orange and black. So he felt that this was significant enough to employ these types of phrases. Um, as sympathetic as he was to Peterson, he liked him, he was there to honor him, he knew the family, he had helped them out, all of these things, and yet there was still that sense of otherness, still that sense of we're talking about another race as if they, they're not one of us. That's where I can like you and I can help you and I can be, have these positive, warm feelings for you, but you're not the same as me. And that's the impression one gets from the words that he's using here. And I think it's very evocative of the attitudes that were prevalent at the time. But he did have one uh, rhyme that, I, that is probably his most elegant one. And so we meet to decorate by a token on the freedman's coat, the man who was first in any state to cast a freedman's vote. Now, I got two titles out of that. This talk, this talk is called uh, Token on the Freedman's Coat. My book is called To Cast a Freedman's Vote. So I guess I can't be too hard on him because I, I stole him his work. Um, after the, the presentation was over, uh, Thomas Peterson went to the photographic studios of William R. Tobias on uh, High Street there in Perth Amboy. He was a photographer where this picture was taken. If you have seen a photo of Thomas Pearson, this is the photo you've seen. Now, I mentioned daguerreotypes before that were one-offs. This would have been, uh, th this particular picture was made on a glass plate as a negative, which meant that multiple copies of it could be made. I know of three surviving copies. There probably are others out there somewhere, probably in somebody's attic and they don't know what they have. This example is from the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And it's a particularly fine example. And you can see him with his medal there. Now, this is uh, another print that is in the collection of the Perth Amboy Public Library. And you can see that it's in a little rougher shape. There is um, the, 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 it's a little bit faded. There is, uh, the, the backing is cut up. Uh, Gary Sorecki, uh, some of you may know, he's a uh, photography historian and ex uh, expert um, specializing in New Jersey photographers. And he examined this and he thinks that the fading is consistent with sun damage. And we speculate that the backing was cut down in order to, to make it fit into a frame. So uh, this may have actually been on display somewhere. We don't know uh, 
where it came from or how it got into the library. There was a pencil mark on the back uh, belonging to, it looks like this is R.L. Young. I did find a Ralph L. Young living in Perth Amboy, uh, this is, but he, he was there after Peterson uh, had died. So uh, what the connection was, if any, I don't really know. Um, there is a reference to Peterson uh, having um, sold copies of this picture as souvenirs at picnics and street fairs and that sort of thing, uh, maybe as a way of making extra money. Um, and so maybe that's how they came by it. Now this is, this example, this is probably what the Perth Amboy photo looked like when it was newer. Uh, this is in the collections of the New Jersey Historical Society here in, in Newark, where I am. And you, you can see there's a Tobias uh, imprint at the bottom. Um, this is a particularly fine example, a very strong image, not a lot of uh, damage. But what's really fascinating about this one is what is on the back. Now, each of these prints, they all have the same, that same label, inscription on the metal. And that's why uh, this is reflective of these being souvenirs from the event, from the, the awarding of the medal. Uh, but if you note, there is an inscription, Thomas Peterson to J. Lawrence Boggs, October 17th, 1897. And then down at the bottom, there is a list of the men who were on that committee who determined to give him the medal. Uh, now, J. Lawrence Boggs, you see there in that committee list, there's a J. Lawrence Boggs Sr. He, was, he had died by, the, by 1897, but he did have a son by the same name. So what this appears to be is a photo that was autographed by Peterson to the son of one of the men who was on that committee. As far as I know, this may very well be the only example of Thomas Peterson's handwriting that survives. So that, that makes this one particularly special because of that, that personal touch. So I told you all about the medal and, and the story behind it. Um, now I want to take that step back. We talked at the beginning about how Peterson's story takes on a very different uh, appearance when you put it in that broader context and take that step back. And what I want to talk about here is the end of the Reconstruction era. And we're going to relate this back to the medal in a moment. But uh, so, as I said, Thomas Pierce's story is always presented in this way of being uh, the, the, this, this moment of progress, you know, everything getting better, getting better. Um, Peterson lived to 1904, and so he lived to see the period we're going to talk about. He, he was the beneficiary, in a sense, of Reconstruction, of the 15th Amendment, um, and he would live to see how that played out. So in 1876, there was a presidential election. Uh, Samuel J. Tilden, he was the Democrats candidate for, for office. Uh, he actually won that election. Um, and I should, I, I should point out that in all of American history, this is a significant election for many ways, but in all of American history, this one had the largest voter turnout to date. 81.8% of the eligible voters turned out for this one. So we'll see what happens in November, but um, that, that, this one still holds the record. So if you're wondering you know, why you don't remember Samuel J. Tilden, President Tilden, it's because he lost in the Electoral College to Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican. And uh, he won the Electoral College by 185 to 184. Another uh, significant part about this election, that, that is the narrowest Electoral College victory in American history. Um, so when it came time to, for a Congress to certify the, the results of the election, to name uh, Hayes as president, there was a concern that the Democrats might filibuster this. They might, um, want to recount or whatever because it was such a close election and technically he did win the popular vote uh but they didn't and the reason they didn't is they came to an agreement with the republicans uh it, it's gone down in history as the compromise of 1877 and basically what this this what they wanted in return for not contesting this election was the end of reconstruction 
And primarily what that meant was removal of Union troops, federal troops from the South. There were some other agreements about uh, financial aid and, and making sure there was a Democrat uh, on his cabinet and so forth. Um, but the main part to this that is important to Pierce's story is there was kind of a gentleman's agreement that the former Confederacy in the South would be permitted to deal with their Negroes as they saw fit without any interference from the North. What in practice that meant, well, the, what that end, uh, ends up meaning, it, this is why people call it the 1877 corrupt bargain, because what this ended up meaning was the rise of Jim Crow. Uh, all the uh, advances that Peterson saw at the end of, uh, w w at the, end of the Civil War uh, that people like him saw were going to be eroded, were going to be erased. I mean, think about for a moment, slavery had been the defining uh, feature of American life for black people in the United States. And it had been removed, that yoke had been removed at great cost in blood and treasure to the nation. And it must have seemed like uh, now, finally, they were, there was an investment being made in the future. At last, they were going to get their fair shot at a seat at the table of American democracy. There were Negro universities. There, were, there was the Freedmen's Bureau that would help them to transition from being property to being, being citizens. Um, it must have been a very hopeful time, in a sense. And yet, because of the 1870, 70, 1877 compromise, we would see the, the gains that, may, that were made be eroded. By the dawn of the 20th century, uh, the Negro vote in the United States had been as good as nullified, especially in the South. Uh, there were black politicians, there were black men running for and winning office on local level, state level, federal level. Thomas Peterson himself ran for, albeit unsuccessfully, a council seat in Perth Amboy. Um, his brother, Lewis, ran for and won uh, as a justice of the peace in Plainfield, New Jersey. So again, you know, very hopeful, very, you know, that this was a very transitional uh, period of American history. And yet, by the time Peterson dies in 1904, he sees all of those advances wiped out by Jim Crow. In the South. Now, I would consider the Peterson period of voting and civil rights to be bookended, obviously at the one end by, the, by 1870, the 15th Amendment. Um, it gets, starts to get eroded but with the 1877 compromise. I would put at the other end of the Peterson period, 1896 plus E.B. Ferguson, Supreme Court decision. And if you are not familiar with the details of that Supreme Court case, uh, you will be familiar with the phrase that came out of it, separate but equal. This gave a legal foundation for the segregation that would last on into the 20th, the 20th century. Plessy v. Ferguson would not be overturned until 1954 with uh, Brown v. Board of Education. Um, and yet, the, 18, the 1884 voting medal sits in the middle of all of this. So while Peterson's story isn't as uplifting and as progressive as it gets presented to us when we celebrate him. Um, what happened in Perth Amboy, what happened with this group of white people giving him this medal in 1884 in the middle of this regression stands out even more. It becomes more special in a sense. I would say that they were pinning a medal to the man's coat for doing something in another part of the country at the same time they would have been putting a noose around his neck for having to do that. So it's not as happy, uplifting a story, but it is very special. And the discussions the talk about, about race, about suffrage, about the franchise, from everything from gerrymandering to voter ID laws, all of these things, it all comes from this moment. I, the, 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 that relationship between suffrage and citizenship was consummated when Thomas Pearson dropped that ballot into that ballot box in Perth Amboy, New Jersey.
Now, I find this story obviously fascinating, fascinating enough that I wrote a book about it uh, to cast a Friedman's vote, Thomas Mundy Pearson at the intersection of suffrage, citizenship, and civil rights. And if anyone is interested in, in a copy of it, it's only 20 bucks plus shipping handling. And um, you can go to gardenstatelegacy.com on the homepage, scroll down a little bit and you'll see the ordering information. And uh, I always joke that I won't even charge you extra for my autograph. Um, let me know if you want me to make it out to anyone in particular and I would be happy to do so. And with that, um, I'm gonna unshare my screen here. And John, if you wanna come back in, if we have any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, entertain you. Um, yeah, hi, Gordon. And, and then thanks for that. Boy, there's a, a lot to unpack there, as they say. <laughs> yeah. um, and you've, you've done a really good job in the talk of, uh, of summarizing that and the book goes into it all uh, in additional detail and I, I really recommend it. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's not six inches. It's not a huge book, but it's, it's, it packs a lot and, you know, uh, a lot in and it's, it's so much can be pulled out of this uh, story. Now we are, I am watching the comment thread. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, do we have, we have some viewers now. I mean, uh, it's kind of a nice, Kind of a nice day, so I think some folks might be watching this later and might want to contact you by email through Garden State Legacy for sure. questions. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute here. Uh, looks like we have something. Uh, and I'm just excuse me for for leaning over. Uh, uh, Isaac asks, despite the ratification of the Fifteenth Amendment in 1870. Many black men faced voting obstacles like literacy tests and, and poll taxes and violence. Right. Um, absolutely. Yeah, that, that was all part Something of that, those Jim Crow laws that were kind of unleashed by the 1877 compromise or corrupt bargain, depending on your uh, paper burr. Yeah, and I think that those, uh, I mean, people talk about, um, there was there was suffrage in in uh, I think some of the New England states even before the civil rights. So I think that's yes. why when we talk about Peterson, we have to uh, qualify the first African American to vote under the Fifteenth Amendment. But but there yeah. were um, poll taxes, literacy taxes, uh, you know these these impediments, and yeah. I mean the right to vote was limited, um, not certainly in racial terms, but also in various ways. I mean, the original franchise, the original, uh, the vote, the, who could vote under the original constitution was was very limited, uh, especially well, by what the, we the, Yeah, today. I mean, the early, the early state constitutions and including New Jersey's, um, they did not have, I mean, the, the qualifications of vote tended to be, you had to live there for a certain length of time and be worth a certain amount of money. In other words, prove that you had a vested interest in the well-being of your community. Uh, but it did not have limitations on either race or gender. And we know that there were women voting, there were black people voting. I found reference in, uh, I think it was 1820, to a black woman voting in Hunterdon County. So, uh, you know, yeah, but it was, it, you know, that was changed later on where they, they, they put in these limitations uh, and so on. But, um, yeah. The, the, the significance of Pearson's vote, you, you see people talk about him as being the first black voter in the United States, and that's not true. Uh, he is the first black voter under the 15th Amendment. And for the, the first 90 some years of the, the country's existence, even though the premise of America is that legitimacy of government is dependent on the uh, consent of the governed, um, the mechanisms by which that consent is given or rescinded, which is was understood to be the ballot box, was never formally defined. For that matter, the what it meant to be a citizen had not been formally defined. So this was the first time in American history that anyone voted. I mean, the first person who was in line that day, the first white, it could only have been a white man, also made history. We don't know who he was, but this was the first time anybody, any American, got to vote with the full guarantee and protection of the United States Constitution. And, the, and under the 14th Amendment is the first time that the concept of citizenship, of birthright citizenship, was articulated in a formal federal overarching way. Yeah, I have heard um, some scholars call the Reconstruction Constitution sort of a whole a, a renewal, as if it was a new, a new government. Really, you know, the, it's it's sort of a new constitution. It's an amendment to the Constitution, but it really changes the nature of that 
civic participation that you're, that you're talking about. And also, and also just the idea of that balance between states and between state governments and a federal government. Uh, you know, that, that dynamic, that tension is very much a part of that history. It's, I mean, it's still part of the American system. Uh, this was the, 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 the Reconstruction Amendments really asserted the authority of a federal government to dictate certain fundamental rights and to enforce certain fundamental rights that being a citizen meant X number of rights, and we have the right to impose that and to enforce that on, us, on the states. Um, that was, yeah, that was a, a major sea change in terms of constitutional thinking, I think. Um, okay, we have another, oops, I have another question here uh, from Stephen, uh, who asked, "How did Peterson wind up in Perth Amboy, and uh, you know what were his ancestors? Where did his ancestors originate? I mean, I guess so to Peter the extent of Peterson was born in what was then Woodbridge, what is now Metuchen. Uh, his father, who was also named Thomas, he was a uh, he lived on the as far near as we could tell, they lived on." Uh, the farm of Ezra Mundy. Uh, I don't find any evidence of him having been a slave. I think he was an employee, but as was common, you lived on the farm or where you know that you worked on. It was a it was a, a large farm, um, and I believe that we believe that's where Peterson was born. That's where we, we call him Thomas Mundy Peterson. That's where the Mundy comes from because it wasn't uncommon for for a black person to take on the last name of the white person that they worked for. And both father and son did go by Tom Mundy as well as Tom Peterson at different points in their lives for different reasons. Um, in 1826, uh, yes, they moved to uh, I, I, all these dates that kind of trying to keep them all straight. In any event, when he was still very young, they moved from Metuchen to Perth Amboy. And uh, exactly why they did, where I don't really know. It's hard. That, I don't know that's knowable. I mean, probably because there was work, or maybe there were maybe there were other people who, you know, said what a wonderful place it was. I don't. I don't really know. But uh, th they moved to Perth Amboy, and that was where he spent the rest of his life. That was where he voted. That was where he worked. That's where he died. He's buried behind uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church, both uh, him and Daphne, uh, in Perth Amboy. And of course, uh, trying to trace genealogy back uh, previous generations uh, under this, the system of slavery is, is sadly challenging at best, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, and I don't even know that, that his father, I know his mother was a slave. And actually, I, I probably know more about her history because there were records associated with her and her manumission. So there's actually something to go on with her. Uh, with his father, the best I can say is, is something that Peterson himself said. There was a, an interview with him, and I, I think it was 1883, just before the, the, the medal, um, where he identifies his father as having been born in Bergen County. So that's all I know. I don't know when he was born, but that's the best I can say is that he was born in Bergen County. He was on Ezra Mundy's farm in Metuchen, and they moved to Perth Amboy, and he died shortly thereafter. Okay, uh, we have one more, one more question here. Uh, I'm, gonna ha I'm gonna lean again, excuse me. Uh, Isaac asked, what percentage of black men voted during this time period, that, that reconstruction era, I think he means, and, and how did Jersey, the white folks in, uh, of New Jersey react to that practice, you know, uh, acting on, uh, the same, on the franchise? Actually, I, I, I don't have a, 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 like specific actual numbers at hand, but um, I do know that there were a lot because, I mean, just in that one article about Moses Shank, uh, he was the first of around 100 black men who voted in Princeton. Uh, there are other anecdotal, you know, diary entries in Somerset County that talk about, you know, seeing all these black people, black men showing up at the polls. So they did come out. It's the, uh, again, I don't have the numbers at hand, but uh, it does appear that it was a significant number of them. Um, and, and, and actually, this was this was throughout the country because the, there there's stories of other men who black men who thought that they were the first to, to voter as well. And I talk about them in the book in the book. Um, 
news traveled a little bit slower back then. So, so they, they, they you know, thought they were. And so one guy until it was thought that he was the first voter until the 1990s. So, um, it, you know, this was something that was throughout the country uh, in the South as well. Um, to some extent, there was a a they were treated like almost as a commodity in a sense where if you could get them to vote for your side, it was thought it would be easy to do. They could be bought off. They could be controlled with alcohol or food or whatever it is. And there are stories of, you know, Repu of, of democratic, you know, uh, uh, plantation owners, you know, paying off their, 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 their former slave, their child is sick, they pay for them to go get a doc to go see the doctor and, oh, by the way, you might want to vote in this election for our side. You know, uh, so the reasons were not always egalitarian and, and noble. A lot of times it was because these were largely uneducated people who were easily manipulated. And there were white people who were that way too. But, you know, this, this was a, again, it's very, it gets very complicated and very messy. And um, some people were, were used um, in this process. All right, uh, we're, we're coming up towards, towards an hour and probably cut it off soon, but we do have a, a very deep and open question here to, to close off with. So, uh, and I think, you know, I think, I'm not sure how old you are, Gordon. I know that you're roughly the same age as me, uh, I think. And to think that the Civil Rights Act of 64 was in my lifetime and, you know, it's just that to, just to close off that other period, um, you know, needing to fulfill the, try to fulfill the promise, uh, you know, these dreams, dreams deferred to use that phrase. So, um, Shane is asking, you know, that so much of our memory has been effaced of these periods in this struggle, and why do you, um, why, why do you think our collective memory is so short? I mean, and, and again, this is a, a big question to, to close out on, for, for better or worse. I, I think it's just, it's just the limit of, well, it's two things. It's, it's just the limit of the human lifespan and what seems a long time ago. Uh, we know our own experiences, we know what we're going through, and a lot of times we think that we're the first ones to go through it, or that our moment is, is unique. Um, you know, the, the old saying that history rhymes, and, and you know, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, and, and I find that to be depressingly true sometimes. Um, part of it is also just a, a lack of education in history, a lack of valuing history, at least this is my personal, I don't have children, so I don't know what's going on in the schools, but my sense is that um, we don't value our history as much as we should. We don't learn the lessons that we should. Um, there, there, so it's kind of an anti-intellectualism that I think is taking its toll. Um, you know, so we make, this, we make the same mistakes, you know. <laughs> Um, and, and that is something that when you, like, researching this book, a lot of the conversations, a lot of the language, a lot of the issues could just as well be in the newspapers today in 2020. Um, so cert, it's human, human nature, the, the one constant is human nature, and, and it's that fight against certain aspects of human nature that we just keep having over and over again. I don't know if that is an answer to the question, but this is, that's... Oh, I, I, I think so, to the, to the extent it's an answerable question, I don't know. Um, I, I think that it's certainly, um, you know, uh, an appropriate way to wrap up the talk. And again, it sort of ties it into the, the, the poignancy that, that really is in the whole Juneteenth commemoration, you know, of, of how long it took that message of emancipation to reach Texas. And then, you yeah. know, that long, you know, how symbolic that is of the long struggle for civil rights uh, for all in this country, you know, especially the, the formerly enslaved um, people. And, you know, of how America can live up to the promises of, of uh, that we make, you know, the promises I, 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 that I our think... laws make. I think Peterson's story is very evocative of that idea when you consider, and, and again, this is a man who voted in every election after he could, he paid attention, he participated, he was a, 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 a 
delegate at, in political conventions. He changed parties when they disappointed him. He was paying attention, uh, which I think is one of the things that is important to, to note because that, I mean, it wasn't a, a profile encouraged for him to vote that day because he would, he would, people, white people were supporting him and were encouraging him and all those things. And yet the fact what he made of that opportunity and how he kept participating, kept uh, uh, voting and kept paying attention, it's a very pedestrian thing to do, but it was very important. And it was, it was reflective of the experiences of, you know, a whole host of other black men at that time and eventually black women. Um, but the fact that he saw so many changes and so the reversal, if he was paying attention, he knew of 1877, he knew of Plessy v. Ferguson. He, he saw that happen and he still believed enough in the system to keep, to keep participating, which, you know, speaks to his, his character too. Uh, but that's very evocative of what we're talking about that, you know, the moral arc of the universe, you know, as long as it bends towards justice, not always. <laughs> it gets, it gets deflected many times. And I think, I think, his story is, is definitely uh, reflective of that, and it's relevant to what we're seeing even today. And I think uh, I think we have to do our best to to help that bend, to help that bend towards justice. That's not a passive thing that Dr. King is talking about. Um, so I think on that note, uh, I will thank you for being with us here today, for sharing for sharing your scholarship and this thank book. Thank you for inviting uh, us. I want to thank my colleague Shane, who updated the description of the talk as we were on the fly. I haven't figured out how to do that before the fact, but uh, the link to buy the book is now in the comments on the YouTube. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so you can please check that out. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, thank you, John. For, uh, for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody who. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, no, we're, we're still hearing you. All right. We're thanks. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye.